why we have her around. She knows all the answers. So hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Ferrello. I'm the Program and Membership Associate here at Andy. Um, I know a lot of you through the membership side of my job, um, and I know some some other folks from the program side of my job. So it's great to see some new faces, great to see some, um, some old friends. So thanks for being here. Um, so I'm going to continue the tradition of doing informational aerobics. So apologies if you have food in your hand, but you got to stand up. So stand up if you met somebody new yesterday who you had not known before. Oh my god, look at all you guys. Such friendly people, I love it. Okay, stay standing if you went to last night's happy hour. Oh, sad. <laughs> okay, stay standing if you thought about doing the scavenger hunt, but then got distracted by the mini tacos and the margaritas and the wine. Stay standing. Stay standing. <laughs> And now finally, stay standing if you were on the winning team that ended up getting a free pass to the, to the uh, metrics conference next year. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> well, congratulations, guys, and thanks so much for doing this. There's a dispute. Oh, we were there. We were in hiding. <laughs> we'll talk later. There might be a, another prize. How's that? <laughs> well, thank you all for being here again. It's really great to have you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Catalyst Fund, um, and that's going to get us started for the day, maybe, or maybe not. Sorry. Um, so the Andy Catalyst Fund, for those of you who don't know, um, fuels initiatives aimed at improving collaboration between and the capacity of organizations within the small and growing business sector. Um, so the fund was launched in 2009 with a million dollars in seed funding from the Lemelson Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Shell Foundation. And since then, we've dispersed over $2.5 million to over 39 organizations. And the grant ma making facility has been replenished by a variety of other funders. Um, and so each year, this, the grant selection process is a little bit different. Some of the past proposals, or the past programs have emphasized proposals with the potential to alleviate human capital constraints, drive innovation in, in invention-based enterprises, transform women's entrepreneurship. Um, and then most recently, we've worked with the MetLife Foundation to help support um, projects that are aimed at improving access to financial services for low and moderate income individuals. And so we're excited to have a couple of those winners here actually. Um, so now that you have some context, um, I would like to introduce Genevieve, who is our Director of Research and Impact, who will talk about the latest round of Catalyst funding and will announce the winners. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so we launched this fund in 2017. Um, it was the very first Catalyst Fund that was focused on impact measurement, which was really exciting because we've heard for almost 10 years that there is very, it's very difficult to get funding to actually experiment and do this kind of work. So when the impact program was interested in supporting this kind of project, it was, I think, filling a very important need for the sector. So thank you to DFID's impact program first for that. Um, we were able to disperse um, 120,000 pounds to six different projects. There were actually two different windows. The first was to support collective collaborative projects through our learning labs. Um, we have two learning labs, one in East Africa and one in South Africa. So those groups develop projects that will serve members there as a whole. The second window was for individual organizations to apply to test approaches, to try out some analytical and methodological um, approaches, and then to share their learnings with the field as a whole. So I'm excited to announce that the winners um, in East Africa are Acumen, B-Lab, and Genesis Analytics. Um, in South Africa, Genesis Analytics is a winner again. <laughs> um, and then the individual organizations are Engineers Without Borders Canada, Partners in Food Solutions, and Capital Plus Exchange. Um, and what we've seen with these catalyst funds is that the, the grant itself can really help an organization, but when the whole network can connect with the projects, 
learn from, benefit from, and collaborate with the winners, um, everyone benefits in a much more um, impactful way. So what I'd love to do is invite all of the winners to come up and just talk a little bit about the projects that they'll be working on. And then I encourage all of you to connect with them over the next day, see how you can get involved. Um, if you happen to be based in East Africa or South Africa, um, or if you have colleagues there, please, please connect with them. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Olivia. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm excited to be here with you all today. And um, I will talk briefly about an ecosystem mapping exercise that B-Lab is doing together with Genesis Analytics in East Africa. So I'm not sure how many people in the room know about B-Lab, just by show of hands. I won't make you stand up. <laughs> oh, great. So half my work is done. Um, so B-Lab is a global organization that works to really support for-profit entities that are using the power of business to solve social and environmental challenges. Um, so one way we, we, say, we talk about it is people who are using business as a force for good. Um, as a global organization, we, are, we have presence in all the continents, and B-Lab East Africa is the second youngest in regional setup. We set up our offices last year, January, with funding from DFID's rate program. And so in the work that we do and how we support businesses, um, investors, institutions, um, it's really how can they now start measuring and managing their impact with as much rigor as they do their profits. And to do this, we offer them three different tools to support them. The B impact assessment and B impact management, they are used by companies to track how they're performing and then to manage um, the impact they're creating and look for areas for improvement. B analytics, it's more investor institutional driven that enables people to aggregate, benchmark, and issue reports on how um, they are doing compared to profit. Um, and so why did we decide to be part of um, this thing? Uh, and why did we apply for the grant making? So when we opened our offices, we partnered with Andy East Africa. And for those who know the Andy East Africa team, they're fantastic. And um, they were leading a bunch of metrics learning lab sessions last year. And um, about midway through the, the whole process, they had a brainstorming session with their members in East Africa to find out, um, were these learning labs helpful? Uh, what are the challenges that they were facing? And two key things came up. One was there was limited transparency or limited knowledge about the tools that were actually available in East Africa and what companies could use them for when it comes to measuring impact. Um, the second big one was um, people needed training. So they might be aware of a tool, but they were not sure how do we actually use that tool. Um, and so from those kind of two things, uh, we were able to now decide, OK, a mapping exercise needs to be done so that people are aware of what tools are available. Um, and then Acumen will speak later. Um, they took up the role of let's start doing training workshops to get people familiarized with the tools that are available in market. Um, and for all of us, it's a collaborative process. Um, so Acumen, Genesis, and B-Lab, our end goal in East Africa is really how do we then strengthen adoption of impact measurement and management in East Africa? Because measurement has been there and for the most part has been driven by investors in our little bubble. Um, but management was something that people were not really doing. Um, and so our approach, we, we started by doing research. And that was the first three, four months, let's say, of the, of the year, where we looked at uh, existing tools in market and trying to understand um, how people, how, what those tools were for. Um, we currently have a survey that's going on where we're collecting information from different players in the East African market, um, companies, investors, INGOs, NGOs, associations, government associations are pretty big in East Africa, um, and different intermediaries to just understand um, what are they using impact for and what tools are they using, just in case we are also not aware of tools in the, in the community. And this is targeted both for Andy members and non-Andy members, because um, we feel like it's an ecosystem thing that needs to happen. We'll then also start doing sh uh, kind of sharing or uh, I don't know how to do like a kumbaya moment where we all come together and do roundtable discussions in Kenya and Uganda um, to talk about findings, get people's feedback, um, and review 
one last time what we have. And um, the cool thing that we're working on is then develop a mapping uh, of the different tools. So this is a mock-up. This is exactly how it's going to look like. Um, but the map will talk about the different tools that are available, compare the tools, talk about who's actually doing those tools, um, and what um, what different companies can use that tool for. So if you're in ag, this is a tool for you. If you're an ag company that's project specific, maybe AMP Impact is what you use. Um, if you look, if you're agnostic, then there's this particular tool. And then also tag onto that case studies from people who are actually using that tool so that you understand how they're applying it. Um, and so what I need from you, go take the survey. If you know anyone else, take the survey. And then if you're a measurement organization, um, please, reach out to me, we want to do, we're doing in-person interviews to understand what you're doing. That's it. Good morning. Um, my name is Sonia Kuguru. I work at Acumen's Lean Data. If you don't know Lean Data already, we're an impact measurement approach incubated at the Acumen Fund. So as Genevieve has already said, there's a huge need um, for impact measurement learning within the Andy East Africa community. And Acumen has been a really active member within that community um, over the course of many years. And we have noticed that the need is not just to be exposed and to have access to these tools, but the need is to know how to do them. I was just speaking with someone this morning and none of impact measurement has to be rocket science. And so for a lot of the members who might not have the, um, the capacity to go for an RCT or even for lean data, what they want to be able to do is to practically apply these tools on their own. And so what we are doing is we are hosting trainings and workshops for and East Africa members to access and practically learn about, very literally practical, um, some of these tools. So we started with Lean Data as the first one, of course, and our chief impact officer at Acumen, Tom Adams, came and taught uh, members in East Africa and Nairobi about the workshops about Lean Data. And the second one will be with Genesis Analytics next month on the theory of change. How you all can help me is if you have, um, if you know anyone or any organization who you think would be a really, really strong um, trainer for our members, then please do let me know. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Noel Verinder. I'm from Genesis Analytics. Um, it's good to hear that my company's got a lot of airtime this morning. <laughs> I wasn't too sure that, that was going to happen. So just a big, uh, brief background on who we are. So we are an economics-based consultancy firm based out of Johannesburg, South Africa, with offices in Nairobi and London, where I am based. Um, we received this grant to do a mapping the landscape for impact measurement in South Africa. I'm very lucky to have had Olivia go before me because what they're doing is pretty much what we're going to be doing in South Africa. Um, but to just give you a little bit more, so on the problem statement, um, IMM is still very nascent in South Africa. However, there's a lot going on uh, through the government's preferential points program, et cetera. There's a lot of work being done on measuring and managing impact. Um, but there, is, there isn't really a central place for this knowledge. So we think it's worth collating and sharing what is going on inside the country. So the objective is to generate awareness and understanding of the IMM landscape in South Africa amongst the, um, the learning lab participants. And how we're going to do this is really, oh, someone snuck in some sneaky um, <laughs> animations there. So um, first of all, it's going to be a very collaborative effort with a lot of engagement. So engaging a lot of the, the learning lab um, participants as well as investors and actors in the space. Um, it is exploratory, so there's going to be a lot of breadth. So through surveys, trying to map out what is happening in the space, what tools are being used, who's doing what. Um, but then also going a little bit deeper with a few interviews and case studies to understand how people are using these tools and how effective are they, what successes there are, et cetera. 
Um, obviously, it goes without saying there should be credibility of this research, so it will be very transparent through the whole process. Um, there'll be a lot of sharing intermediary findery, findings and discussing with the steering committee form for the project. And then lastly, there's no point in doing this unless we're going to disseminate it. So the key focus is about trying to collect all this data um, and understanding the sector and put it in a way that is understandable for everyone. So, and then drive the dissemination of that. So what the output is going to be is some form of um, interactive infographic. This is just an idea, it's not necessarily going to look like this, but as Olivia says, mapping out who is doing what, what works in what sector, um, and essentially being able to click on different things and interact with it and get into deeper information as you go along. And alongside this will be a supplementary guide that gives a lot more information and the case studies behind what works and what doesn't. Um, so as Olivia said, um, what I need from you is um, just to chat, have conversations, find out if there's anyone doing anything interesting in South Africa, um, or putting me in contact with colleagues of yours who are based there. We are just kicking off, so we're not as far along the, the chain. Um, we got kicked off in the past few weeks, so it's still very, very early days for us. Thank you. That's Lynn. Okay, Lynn. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. How are you? So, uh, Capital Plus Exchange uh, is a uh, nonprofit corporation that builds the capacity of financial institutions to serve small businesses more effectively as a way of increasing jobs and all the sorts of things that we know about. And. Um, uh, a few years ago, we recognized that there was a class of small businesses that are not on banks' uh, balance sheets, and that is um, private organizations that serve a social purpose, social enterprises. And uh, we were looking, we noticed uh, particularly about uh, private schools. So we started doing research and uh, found that private schools, especially in low-income neighborhoods, informal settlements, that sort of thing, are really a predominant way that children get educated. <clears throat> and so uh, we found, uh, we did uh, field research in seven uh, sub-Saharan cities and found that um, between 40 to 86% of the kids attend these little, these private schools. So it's obviously, these schools are an obvious way to um, uh, improve education, to increase people's ability to, to learn, earn livelihoods, that sort of thing. So then uh, when we surveyed them, we, we learned a ton of stuff, their income, their expenses, their, their student base, all that sort of thing, and asked what their greatest challenges were. And in every single city, uh, lack of access to credit came out as one of the top three challenges. So we, then we started talking to all the different banks that we've worked with and interviewed and surveyed and understood uh, what their limitations were. And in many cases, they didn't even know these schools existed. So we, uh, out of all this research, we've created our theory of change about how to, how to create change and how to, how to kind of unleash these schools so that they can grow and they can educate many more children. And then we've also added in a component about uh, f structuring the financing to incentivize improvements in learning outcomes because e even though kids are in school, they aren't learning in many places. <clears throat> so uh, we now, as we think about how do we measure impact, uh, not only do we have to get data from the financial institutions, which we've been doing, but also from the schools, but we don't have access to the schools because we only work through the financial institution. So. Um, we uh, greatly appreciate the Catalyst grant because it will be, we'll be using it to figure out a methodology and a tool for, for reaching these schools through the financial institutions. And um, the tool obviously has to be um, uh, 
uh, easy to use and and um, one that financial institutions won't mind using, uh, which means it has to take almost no time, uh, and also provide data that they really value. It also has to collect data or provide a benefit to the schools. So those are kind of all the things that we'll be juggling. So um, we're just in the beginning of thinking about this, and so uh, we look forward to, to figuring out a methodology for, for collecting this data and then um, sharing it. So what we could use from you is if anybody's done anything similar, would greatly appreciate learning your experiences. And I know I've had one or two conversations with people already. And we also want to design this tool so it can be used for other SME segments. So it can be uh, replicated elsewhere. So I would appreciate any advice or suggestions, uh, tools that you've experienced. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Courtney Bolinson, and I work with Engineers Without Borders Canada. And I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Donna Mertens, in the front row. Um, so if you're interested in what I talk about here, you can find either of us today to learn more. Um, so a little bit about EWB first, because our name can be a bit of a misnomer. So we actually do have a component of our work that is impact investing. Um, we invest in seed stage businesses. We have nine in our investment fund right now. Um, we provide patient capital, so uh, we spend about five years or so supporting our businesses. Um, and we're primarily focused in East and West Africa. Um, and so since we're a seed stage uh, impact investor, we find ourselves faced with a lot of, I think, seed stage acute challenges in terms of impact measurement. Um, and I outlined a couple here. So I think a really good example is some of our businesses are such at such an early stage that they don't actually have very many clients. So our sample size is really small. Or maybe they have a lot of clients, but over a really short period of time. So we don't have longitudinal data to work with and utilize to understand impact. So I've been thinking a lot about um, what, are the, what are the appropriate questions to be asking as an evaluator at the seed stage. An impact evaluation with a capital I like Dean Carlin was talking about yesterday is probably not really an appropriate fit at that stage. And yet, I really see the seed stage as, this, um, as an important opportunity stage because these early stage businesses are um, they're nimble, they're early, they're able to respond to cl customer feedback really quickly. Often what we've seen are major pivots in business models at this stage. And so it's kind of a critical time for us to understand what kind of um, indicators of early impact we're seeing and what feedback benefits beneficiaries have at a broad level so that those entrepreneurs can take that information into consideration and make changes early on. And I think most importantly, these pivots are made so that they're able to have a greater uh, social or environmental outcome of their work, which is the ultimate goal that we're all trying to achieve. So this is an important stage. Evaluation is hard, so what do we do? <clears throat> so. Um, we hypothesize that transformative evaluation may be a useful tool here. So transformative evaluation, this comes from the field of program evaluation. It's an approach to doing evaluation work that in engages beneficiaries, especially the most marginalized beneficiaries, throughout the entire evaluation process. Um, so I think a good analogy that people are familiar with are kind of participatory research type of methods. This is sort of an umbrella that that would fit under. Um, and so um, I think that th this approach to evaluation, it, it also allows us to identify and understand multiple experiences with a program or a product. And I think that's really critical for a seed stage business because this is kind of, it's a, a robust type of beneficiary data that we're getting at an early stage that they can then utilize to make those changes, to catalyze those pivots in the business early on um, so, that they can, so that they can scale later on and have a greater social and environmental impact. 
Um, so, but this is really new. So we, uh, we applied for the Catalyst Fund and we're excited to have the opportunity to test the usefulness um, and, and, and applicability of transformative evaluation techniques in the impact investing sector. So we have um, an ambitious plan to do three different things this year. Um, first, Donna and I are gonna work with one of EWB's uh, ventures uh, we, which we're, we haven't identified yet, but um, it'll be in either East or West Africa. Um, and so we're actually gonna do a pilot study. Let's test and do an, a transformative evaluation with them. And out of that, we'll publish a detailed case study. And my intention with that is for it to be at the level of detail that it's replicable so that other people in the sector can see not just what we did, but at a level that they can then also try and do it um, themselves, yourselves. Um, in addition, we want to do a meta evaluation. So because this is applying a new technique to a new field, um, I think it'll be important for us to not just do a pilot, but to kind of do that meta level of evaluating our evaluation to understand where is this methodology, where are we having challenges in the sector applying it, where are we seeing emergent opportunities, um, that kind of information so that we can kind of start to say something at a sector level where where this may or may not be valuable and how we might use it. And then finally, um, I think uh, especially for everyone in this room, we um, hope to create an applied toolkit. And the idea behind this would be a kind of an outline of what are the, the um, key principles of a transformative evaluation and how might you apply them depending on who you are. So from an, an entrepreneur perspective, an investor perspective, um, or an evaluator perspective. So here's what the principle is and here's how you might apply it. So I'll just finish by saying we really are honored to have an opportunity to apply this methodology in the impact investing space, and that wouldn't be possible without this grant. So if you are um, doing seed stage impact evaluation and you have similar challenges, I'd love to hear what you're facing and how this might affect that. And if you have any experience with transformative evaluation, let us know. We'd love to um, learn from your experiences as well. And I'm not Meredith from Partners in Food Solutions, but she has sent a video of herself describing the project. So just one moment. Good morning, everyone. My name is Meredith Koss. I'm the Director of Impact at Partners in Food Solutions. We are very pleased to be included in the next cohort of the Andy Catalyst grant funding. Um, I'm here this morning to explain to you a little bit about what we're going to be using that grant for. Um, our proposal from measurement to management will be using client outcome data for business decisions. And we propose to um, do this because PFS is a nonprofit consortium of leading global food companies that works to strengthen um, food security, nutrition, in Sub Saharan Africa by linking PFS corporate volunteers with clients or SGBs to provide remote technical assistance. And what we found is this at times requires data sharing um, from long distances and the business about business and operational performance that the SGB may or may not have digitally or even readily available. So we wanted to take a step back and explore why this might be and what, um, how we could perhaps help SGBs in unlocking the power of their data to make better business decisions. So our research questions are, um, what business outputs and outcomes are most useful to the SGB to track? It's very important for us that this be a uh, very client-centric um, approach that we find things that are of highest utility for our clients and what do they wish to track better what are the challenges in doing so what are the challenges in doing analysis what decisions would they like to be able to more easily make um, and then what food industry best practices are clients most interested in tracking as well so we propose to do this uh, through three activities first um, through a gap analysis of um, looking at our own data and seeing um, which of our previous clients um, might have information that we could leverage to help make better business decisions around five main outcomes and um, the five main impact metrics. And what we're looking at testing is uh, change in employees, 
production sales, production volume, production costs, and profitability analysis. And of those high potential clients that we feel have um, the capability of providing this information and interest in doing so, we would then go on to activity two, where we um, do interviews um, with selected clients to gather the proposed metrics if we don't already have it or get updated information. Um, do a preliminary analysis for them along these lines. Uh, also truth testing them and seeing are these really the metrics that are important to you? Um, what is most interesting to you as a client, most useful to you? Um, assessing what data gaps and challenges they have in, in collecting it and also analyzing it and then making suggestions uh, of what they could do in the future. Um, and what we'll be doing is creating individual client reports, 15 to 20 client reports, and providing suggestion for tools um, based on those reports. The last activity will then, once the client reports are delivered, we want to bring back a subsect of these clients um, to discuss with them in a focus group discussion how they've used it, what you know, maybe why they haven't used it. Um, uh, just again, focus on that utilization of. Um, uh, unlocking information to make better business decisions and why that challenge does or does not exist um, and to share lessons with each other as well. So um, our expected outputs are going to be 15 to 20 individual client reports as well as a grant report outlining the findings against our research questions as well as um, the outcomes of a better understanding of what SGBs want to see regarding outcome level data and the challenges they face in using it as well as a little bit around format, um, how mo most useful this information is for them to be received and how best to set them up to continue to gather and use this data long after we finish working with them. So we're very excited for this opportunity and want to take uh, the time to thank Andy for, um, for this grant and we we're really looking forward to jumping in. Thanks and have a great day. Awesome. So um, thank you to all the winners who came up and talked a little bit about their projects. We're really excited um, about the outcomes of all of your, your projects and programs. And Andy's excited to continue to expand these types of op opportunities to members and um, even to non-members as well. So with that said, I would like to introduce Carolina Rubino. There she is. small space, but I'll manage. I don't need this. Um, so, um, hello, um, hola. <laughs> I'm Carolina Robino from the International Development Research Center from Canada, and um, very honored to be here with you today. And um, I first would like to tell you in a minute what's IDRC, uh, because I'm sure most of you don't know, and I won't ask you to stand to see whether you know. <laughs> Just remain seated. So uh, the in Canada's International Development Research Center is a grant-making organization, and um, we are funded uh, through the Canadian government and also through other donor fund, fund, uh, partnerships that we manage. And uh, what we do with the, those uh, grants, we support research. Research that seeks to provide solutions to the key development challenges that developing countries face. And that research that we support, the particularity that it has is that it's uh, developed by developing countries researchers. Uh, so um, we work on a diversity of uh, sectors or on issues, and I work uh, in a program that is called Employment and Growth, which really focus on trying to address the barriers that uh, most bar marginalized and uh, vulnerable groups face, such as women and youth, to access uh, economic opportunities and towards their uh, economic empowerment. So under that area, and why we are here, is that um, we are working uh, around supporting research that a uh, help scale up uh, inclusive business models and, model and businesses that are seeking to have an impact to foster women and youth inclusion. So um, 
we have an hypothesis, which is uh, that, uh, and, and that's the rationale behind the cluster of programming that are, we are re developing in this area, that is that by brokering relationships between research centers and researchers and uh, businesses that are looking for an impact on social inclusion and intermediaries that are helping businesses achieve that goal, uh, we can help those businesses scale up and scale their impact. And why? Um, we think there are kind of two at least main roles that local researchers and local research institutions can play in this uh, local entrepreneurial ecosystem. And one has to do with nurturing and, and, and generating and bringing up a new generation of business leaders. Um, and so we need uh, uh, local research, uh, local uh, universities that are really uh, coming up with and helping uh, this new generation of business leaders. And the other key, key area we think uh, local researchers and research institutions can, can play a role is around um, helping these businesses and entrepreneurs and intermediaries that are looking to have an impact to assess their impact. That's why we are here. That's why many, a couple of our partners uh, that are actually implementing these kind of projects are here, such as you heard this morning, uh, Eduardo from Fundación Paraguaya and their poverty stoplight uh, tool, uh, which is really about um, a methodology for families to self-assess poverty and how uh, business associations and businesses are using the tool to eliminate poverty in their businesses. Um, another example is we have project with Sistema B and B Lab uh, around impact measurement and, and, and generating this new generation of business leaders. And uh, we are very happy to say that we have a partnership with Ande, and that's um, what I'm going to, to present today. Um, and uh, the partnership with Ande really um, seeks to um, um, strengthen the field of impact measurement. Uh, 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 and one of the key tools under that project is what we call the Gender Lens Impact Measurement Fund. Um, so uh, the Gender Lens Impact Measurement Fund, which is the fund that uh, we are going, we are announcing right now, and it's open, and this is kind of the launch of the fund, and so I will ask you to spread the word as well, um, is a key piece of that project. Uh, so I know you might all be thinking, oh, no, 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 impact measurement is hard enough, and now you are uh, exposing another limitation, something that it adds to it, and it's gender lens impact measurement that we now shall be doing. Um, but we, we don't think that way, and I hope I, I'm going to be able to demonstrate that, and that the panel that is going to follow this uh, presentation is also going to make the case for this. Uh, so uh, it is. Uh, let me tell you what it, I think it's not about. So, including gender lens around impact ma management and measurement, it's not about a specific sector. It's not about looking at women. Uh, so, it's really about thinking about impacts from a different perspective. That's why I like the picture of the Criterion Institutes. Um, and it can be in all sectors. Um, so, uh, actually, I think there are many interesting examples. Um, about how bringing a gender lens to impact measurement helps to see opportunities, help to strengthen impact, and actually also to mitigate risks and avoid reproducing inequalities that we are inadvertently doing without having this perspective when we think about impact measurement and management. Um, so I, I was thinking on, a, on an example um, um, around let's say you are producing, uh, you're an entrepreneur and you're producing solar, solar lamps. And that's like really needed, many households are like off grid. And so you are thinking of your customer and you are not really looking at a, through a gender lens. So what does it mean to look for it with a gender lens? Perhaps if you think about the constraints that your customer may face due to gender or created by, by gender, then you might realize that perhaps there are be benefits that you were not thinking about because women are overrepresented in like having to go and collect the wood uh, to get fire at home or you know by using dirty energies women are spend a lot of time in, do in doing the cleaning so uh, what would be the uh, un perhaps 
unconceived effects uh, of the solar lamp that you are thinking. And you might discover that you have a very large customer base that they would actually see a lot of benefits but, uh, uh, to use the solar lamp. But if, and also, uh, perhaps by not bringing this land, you might realize you might lose a lot of potential uh, customers because perhaps the price that you are um, offering your lamp is too high for uh, most of these women would, would be like really happy to have it, uh, but because women uh, tend to be uh, to have uh, lower incomes, then they are not able to pay, to, to pay for that. So really, uh, so you would actually perhaps be contributing inadvertently to reinforce inequalities without thinking uh, from this per perspective. So um, um, what we want to do is to invite you to think uh, on Im uh, about impact measurement and management from this standpoint of view. It's just wearing a glass and thinking about the questions that you wouldn't be thinking otherwise. So um, what we want to do with Ande is to invite uh, researchers, and that's why, why I, I, I was like telling you what the rationale behind our approach to this, invite researchers to collaborate with entrepreneurs, practitioners, um, intermediaries uh, to uh, work together around impact management and measurement with a gender lens. And we understand that um, perhaps incentives for researchers and entrepreneurs and intermediaries are not really aligned. So, uh, but in many cases, researchers really want to make a difference and an impact and contribute to their local communities and entrepreneurs. So perhaps by pu putting in place an incentive for people to work together, uh, we might be helping the field move forward. So this is really, we hope, uh, and we are going to learn a lot about these pilots, and hopefully if it works, we're like really keen to work with others to help this scale up. Uh, but it's very interesting for me, even like when you look at uh, everyone that is here, like how many uh, representatives for research institutions we have here. We have a, a few people working on RCTs, that's kind of very specific type of research, but we are thinking of researchers that, that can bring other expertise to the sector. And for me, it's kind of very strange to think, like, if researchers are really trained to do rigorous assessments and evaluations, why uh, in this sector we are not working with them much more actively? Shouldn't they be a key part of the local entrepreneurial ecosystems? And we are thinking about local researchers. So just imagine the small local entrepreneur that would be um, able to tap into uh, the um, capacities of local researchers and local research institutions to solve some of these issues are around impact uh, management and measurement. So that's the point of uh, our, our uh, Gender Lens Impact uh, Measurement Fund that ANDE is going to manage. And the objective, as it says there, is really to enhance awareness, rigor, and quality of impact assessment practices so that SGVs and intermediaries can better manage their impact to address gender in equality and foster social inclusion. And today we, we are releasing the call for proposal. And uh, one thing that I wanted to mention is that in this process, uh, Andy and IDRC really wants to proactively work with you to help broker those relationships between uh, entrepreneurs, intermediaries, and the researchers. As IDRC, we bring a very strong network of researchers working in developing countries, and they bring all the network of its members, and we think that working together, we can help that collaboration happen. Um, so we will be actively facilitating that matchmaking. And then you can see the process there. So I hope you can help us spread the word and actually participate and apply it. And we are really excited. Um, so thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Carolina. Um, so I would encourage everybody to visit our website, um, read the request for proposals, and come talk to anybody on the Andy team. Obviously, Genevieve and Brie are going to be your kind of go-to people, um, but we would definitely want you to get involved and ask questions about this. There's also going to be a webinar, um, so feel free to come to the webinar and ask questions there as well. 
Um, so obviously, um, related to the gender lens investing and impact management, impact measurement idea, um, we want to continue this conversation. And so I'd like to invite the next panel up to the stage. You and I right now. I'm great. How are you doing? Hi, PJ. How are you? Let's put our big bags behind here. I think it's no. Are you mic'd? No. Do we have another microphone? I'd give you mine. It was an intricate setup. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome morning. to the second day of the Andy Conference at the Aspen Institute in Washington, DC. My name is Mabinti Karoma. And I'm with the Global Impact Investing Network, a part of the Impact Measurement and Management Team. We are really excited today to have a conversation on what does it mean to invest uh, with a gender lens, and how do you measure and manage the impact of that investment? Uh, today, we're going to have more of a conversation and kind of understand the importance of gender lens investing. There have been a lot of conversations, there's been a lot of media coverage, including that gender lens investing is generating $2.2 billion worth of investments. So today we are delighted to have two special guests, great investors. We have CJ Yuhas with the uh, Chief Investment Officer of WWB Asset Management, a subsidiary of Women's World Banking, which makes equity investments in inclusive finance institutions primarily in Women's World Banking Network. We also uh, learned that WWB Asset Management aims to provide responsible growth capital along with technical assistance to women-focused inclusive finance institutions and to demonstrate the business case for investing in women. CJ is currently responsible for over 50 million in investment capital. Prior to launching Women's World Banking's Equity Investment Fund, CJ was the director of Capital Markets Group with primary responsibility for promoting network members' access to commercial sources of funding. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. We also have Heather Kipnis, who is the entrepreneurship lead for IFC's Gender Secretariat. As such, she advises companies in emerging markets on how to close gender gaps in entrepreneurship in order to unlock opportunities for increased profit, growth, and innovation. Heather has over 15 years of experience in international development and financial services across Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East. Of those years, 10 have been dedicated to scaling up women's access to financial and business support services with both private and public sectors across program strategy, design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation initiatives. Previously, she managed the programs and educational activities for a network of 75,000 women-led small to medium enterprises and has held positions in impact investing and private wealth management. Can we please welcome our dynamic panel? So before we get into impact measurement and management with a gender lens, help us understand and really help us context set what it means to invest with a gender lens. I'll start with you, CJ. Okay, thank you. Um, so what it means today to think, uh, to invest with a gender lens um, is still pretty broad definition and we have no problem with that because anyone who's thinking about gender um, when they're investing, we welcome. What's really important is to recognize our power as investors to change um, markets, change companies, change the world. Um, when you're investing in businesses, um, those businesses know they're supposed to create shareholder value. So if as a shareholder you value gender diversity and you value outreach to women, you are going to influence the companies that you're investing in. And that's what we are seeking to do as a, as a gender lens investor. Yeah. 
And Heather, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I completely agree um, with the CJ's comments. I think from IFC's perspective, well, first, there's so many definitions out there for what is gender lens investing. People are like, what is it? OK, if you do understand what it is in your context, where do I start? What do I do? And with those varying definitions, it's often, often hard to say, am I a gender lens investor or not? And I think from IFC's perspective, we, so we work with 2,000 businesses globally, and they're in emerging markets. And the idea is, how can we influence these companies with our capital, our expertise through advisory solutions, and also our influence so they can operate in a sustainable way, but at the same time, we're also helping the families and communities in the markets that we're working in. And so there's a number of ways for us that we're looking at gender lens investing. It's, sometimes it's with a specific product. So we have targeted solutions to address issues like access to finance. So there's various themes that can be addressed, whether it's getting more women into inclusive sourcing opportunities for um, private procurement, or it's addressing the capital gap. We have specific investment products that target that theme. But oftentimes, it's not necessarily a specific gender theme. It's really addressing, I think this was commented earlier with the, the great announcements. Congratulations, by the way. Um, it's really addressing a business challenge and then taking a look to see if gender is an issue, is if gender is a factor into it. And then take, tackling challenges from a more innovative um, perspective. I'll give you a quick example just to kind of ground what I'm saying. We worked with a company in Solomon Islands, and they are a tuna processing plant, and they their labor costs were ridiculously high. And so it was unsustainable. And what we did, we came into that not from a gender perspective. It was more to look at map their employment um, and issues to see what is causing this. And it turned out that 20% of the employees that were causing the attrition were women. And it was because of fam they didn't have family planning needs. They lacked financial literacy. And so they were spending all their money and leaving the, um, and leaving the workforce. And so that's an example of coming at a problem, a business seed, not necessarily with a gender agenda, but more how, is it, how can gender influence this? And so that's a very verbose way to say that's, those are a couple examples of what gender lens investing is to us. Mm -hmm. And, and great for that context setting. And, and Heather, I'm glad that you kind of gave that example because it would be interesting to really understand how do you integrate gender considerations throughout the investment life cycle? Yeah, that's a really great question. So IFC, so there's a couple of ways that we're, we're looking at that. And right now, since this is a metrics conference, I'll, I'll talk from a measurement um, standpoint, and my colleague Arik is in the audience smiling, so <laughs> back me up. <laughs> no, but so right now what we're looking at, so traditionally gender was looked at, um, it, particularly from an impact, perspect, per, impact perspective, post the investment. So if we have a specific investment that's a, maybe it's a, debt, a, credit, a, a credit line to a commercial bank and it's to increase lending to SMEs, the assessment was, OK, afterwards, did we reach those SMEs? How much, um, how much volume did we lend to them? And now, we actually have an assessment process. It's called AIM, an acronym. But basically what it means, it's um, to look at our investments and to assess, is there a potential development impact for gender with this investment? And make a decision on that investment based on the potential of um, gender being addressed. And so. Also, how we're looking at this is, in order for a project to be assessed from a gender lens, we have to, our IOs, um, investment officers, have to be able to state what is the gender gap that's being addressed. So you can't just flag a project and say, oh, there's a lot of women in this sector, so it's a gender investment. Oh, so um, we're address the gender need. No, it has to be assessed and analyzed to see what is the particular gender gap? Are we increasing opportunities for employees? Are we increasing opportunities for women as leaders? Are we getting access to credit to women entrepreneurs? What is the gender gap? And that needs to be put into the um, investment. And our board actually looks at that and approves that based on the development score. So that's at the initial stage. And then, of course, throughout it, we have indicators that we assess based on um, what is the goal that we're trying to achieve and, and measuring the gap. And then afterwards, in terms of gender, I'm just being very broad. So when we talk about impact, it's, you know, oftentimes there has to be a, an, an additional impact assessment. And so depending on what the need is, we'll go in and do that.
Yeah. And how does that compare at WWBS at management, CJ? Um, so when we look at the gender lens investing space, um, first of all, it usually means three things, three different things, or at least people are trying to bucket it that way because <laughs> threes are easy to think yeah. about. So you can be a gender lens investor either by investing in a company that is very gender diverse. So um, that would be one way. You could invest in a company that is women owned. So women owned small businesses. That would be sort of the second way to look at it. Then the third way to look at it is if you're investing in a company that is either creating a product specifically for women or that is somehow empowering women. So you can think about you know, child care centers can be gender lens investing. Um, so when we look at uh, investing in women's financial inclusion, it almost hits all of those because um, we are definitely looking at gender diverse. We, we want to build gender diverse organizations. And that can be something that applies to any industry. Um, we are also very much, because we are providing financial services for small businesses focusing on women, we're also targeting that uh, women-owned business segment. And then finally, um, is it a product and service that is particularly geared toward women or helping women? That is also part of the mission. We're trying to make sure that those financial products are specifically meeting the needs um, and the preferences of women. So we check all those boxes, we like to think. <laughs> And then thinking again in threes, there's three degrees, I would say, of being a gender lens investor. And there are like degrees of difficulty. So the very easiest would be the negative screen. You simply say, I care about this, so I'm no longer going to invest in companies that are 100% run by men and the boards are 100% male. So we see some of that. Um, you could do more of a positive screen and say, I'm going to target one of these three um, types of companies, gender investing. And then finally, you can do what we are seeking to do, which is kind of real shareholder activism mm -hmm. around a gender lens. And so then where do we apply that? I would say in every piece of the um, investment process. So when we are sourcing our deals, we're looking for deals, we're looking for companies that are gender diverse and are reaching women, or will at least say, are you willing and able to work with us into that direction. Mm -hmm. So we're already, it's already at the what's in the pipeline. And then when we do the diligence, obviously you need to incorporate gender in all of those things you're checking. So when you're checking you know, the company management, you're meeting the CEO, you're looking at the HR, you're looking at the um, product design and the credit policies and procedures, you can be looking at gender for all of those things, for example, does the marketing material show women? So it's everywhere. And what you don't want to do when you're doing diligence is, here's my questions for the CEO, here's my questions for HR, here's my questions for the field operations, and these are my gender questions. Because by the time you got to the gender, who are you asking that to? You know, there's not like the gender person. It's, it's throughout the whole policy, uh, process. You got to be asking the CEO, HR director, operations teams. Um, that's diligence. What we found is quite effective is in the negotiations of the documents, you can ask for affirmative covenants on gender. Why not say, together with the other shareholders, let's say, you know, while we're saying there should be nine board members and every investor who holds 10% can name a board member also right, and we will seek to have gender balance on the board. And that's a very powerful thing to go to later when everyone's naming men to the board and say, wait, didn't we say, isn't it in our investment documentation? So we've started to put stuff like that. We've even started to put commitments around, we'll put, um, we'll rewrite HR policies or we'll seek to have policies that are gender neutral, et cetera. I mean, you could do all those things. Um, then you go to kind of your behavior as an investor. You know, how do you vote um, in corporate actions? Um, I'm not gonna vote, I'm gonna vote down a slate of board members that are 100% male. And I'll just say, look, I'm not going to vote on this. May or may not make a difference, depending on um, how big a shareholder I am. But at least you know, I've said, I will not vote for an all male cast of characters unless we actually recruited an equal number and these were the best. Or if you're sitting on the nomination and remuneration committee, you can say, OK, we're recruiting for a new CEO. I just want to make sure that when the recruiter brings us a slate of candidates, 
their remit says you have to bring as many men as women. And then we can still choose a man. We still choose the best person for the job. Um, finally, you get into measurement. So once a year, while we're also doing all the re financial reporting, well, let's look at every product line. And let's look at what percentage is going to women. What's the average loan size going to women? Um, how, what, how many new clients are women? How many retained clients are women? Um, and you get a lot of rich data doing that. So we're also collecting a lot of data on the companies, um, how many women were promoted, how many women were recruited, what is the average pay for women versus men at the various levels. Really interesting stuff. Um, and then finally, it's important to report on that and to sit down with management again and say, these were the results, what do we think? And you look at trends also. Last year you were here, this year you are here, why is that happening? Etc. So that's our process. <laughs> Great, thank you. So in keeping with the theme of our conference, metrics from the ground up, and I know that you, we talked about due diligence, we talked about screening, and ideally you have your impact outcomes and you want to see that realize. Can you talk with us about a situation or experience that you had that it didn't turn out as well? And how did you solve for it or manage that impact? Maybe I'll start with Heather. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Before we go into that, I wanted to just make one comment because um, that came to mind as CJ was talking. I think it's important to your last question is also to think about what type of instrument you're using because that's going to influence. That's going to that's going to send a signal on what type of influence you can have. And so you know, with equity investments, you're going to have a higher level of influence on the companies you're working with and with debt. Um, and so it's just something to take into account in thinking about gender and then gender lens investing to think about where are your pressures for the different levels of influence because it can range quite a bit. Um, so anyways, going back to your question um, in terms of a situation. So there's, um, so this is, it's great that you started off with the $2.2 billion in capitals because, I mean, it's a nascent industry and there's lots of lessons learned. And I think one that really comes to mind is, okay, well, well first I'll start off. Oftentimes we'll work with a company and we come in with the intention to, we'll start with access to credit. So, cause that's something historically where we've been heavily involved. And we come in with the intention, okay, we're going to, you know, disperse X amount of loans to women entrepreneurs. It's gonna be X amount of volume. And we go in there and it's a different story. And so, and oftentimes we underestimate the amount of advisory technical assistance that needs to accompany an investment. And so with gender, it, it can be a heavy lift. And so one example is um, just a little bit of a, a, a war story, so to say, is with a, a commercial bank we were working with in Latin America. And this bank is highly committed to, to gender on all fronts, leadership, employees, and their consumers. Um, but they really wanted to focus on SMEs. And they were also an investment client, not necessarily specifically for gender, but we had extended a line of credit to help them with SMEs overall. And we went there, and they wanted to create a, a program for women SMEs. And we had our baseline and what we expected um, to reach. And we got in there, and they really didn't even have a strong SME banking program. So that's a, regardless of the gender lens. It's like they didn't have the foundation and the fundamentals to even lend to SMEs in general. So how are we going to come in and help them create a women SME opportunity? And so what we ended up doing was, I mean, there's a level of creativity <laughs> that needs to happen. And also, this is all about partnering with your, with your clients. And we decided to focus on women as retail clients. And so it's still addressing the financial inclusion gap. And then we decided to then, once we were to develop that to, and they had their SME banking capabilities in place, we would then extend um, the service. We would then work with them on women SMEs. So it ended up working out really well because the retail portfolio um, produced an IRR of 35% for the bank. So that was quite excellent. And then later on, we came back and did the SME banking. So I mean, the moral of that story is really being able to pivot and be creative and work hand in hand. And you really need a client that is think, that thinks about this from an innovative perspective and is willing to go on that journey with you. And so that had a that had a good ending. Yeah. There's others that may not, but I'll, <laughs> I'll let CJ take those. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> CJ, uh, yeah, talk about an experience for you. All right. Well, I'll talk about one that 
not that doesn't have a good ending. We just don't know the ending yet. <laughs> but it's been a long process. And uh, we, we specifically made an investment in Latin America. It's a good institution, but it's dismal on women in the senior ranks, um, like zero. So when we came in, um, they embraced the idea of gender diversity and liked having the idea of having Women's World Banking along and, and things were going to, um, you know, change. And that was one of the examples where we actually put it in shareholders' commitment. We said, okay, but if we're going to invest, you know, this is why we're investing. We want everyone on board with this. So then um, we're invested. It's now four years later, and the situation hasn't changed. There's still no women. They have tried to recruit, and the women rapidly leave, and it just hasn't been a priority. Now, granted, there's been all sorts of other things going on in that particular country that take the focus away from this is not the priority. There are 100 other priorities. And the company's been performing well. So now it's really hard to register a complaint. And yet, because you know, the response is, you know, why are we talking about women right now? We've got all these other things, and we're managing well, and we're performing well. And that's great. But you know, who knows? Maybe you could be performing better. Uh -huh. um, and, and so this is where having it in the shareholders' agreement was helpful, because OK, guys, it's now four years later. You know, Fine, you've been dealing with a lot of things, but we did commit to this, and when are we going to deal with this? Um, and the other thing that we had to do, because you do have, what we thought we needed to do was some kind of assessment, what's going on in this company that they can't recruit senior women or can't retain them? Why do they keep leaving? And so that required an outside consultant, because they weren't going to figure it out on their own. But we also didn't have technical assistance resources, so somebody's going to have to pay for this, and that somebody was going to have to be the company. So what we were able to do, though, is demonstrate, you know, you have to make the business case. And so there is a lot more research out there now about the effectiveness of diverse teams, the importance of diverse teams. And frankly, the, the risk management story is helping us right now. Like when you see, mm -hmm. you know, Uber, the Trevor Kalashnik, or <laughs> I can't say his name, losing his company because of a lack of gender diversity. You know, that starts to resonate a little mm -hmm. bit. Or, you know, some of the, the horrors, the Me Too movement. It, um, there's a lot of good data for why this is the right thing to do and the smart thing to do for the company. And when we bring that in front of a board, the board has agreed now to invest in this analysis. They've hired somebody that, who has come and done it and has um, prepared some recommendations, which we have yet to see. But so our role now will be to see what those recommendations are and make sure they're put through. And, and we'll see how it goes. But mm -hmm. that's kind of our role as an, as an impact investor, I think. Well, thank you for sharing those stories. Before we open the floor for, for uh, questions, I wanted to, to see if you have any top tips on measuring and managing, managing the impact of a, an investment with a gender lens for a new investor or an, an investor looking to have a gender lens fund. What advice would you give? I'll start off with Heather. Sure. Yeah. So I'll take it back to one of the points that I made earlier is <clears throat> I think it's really starting with the business need that, you're, that you need to address. And so oftentimes there's a misconception that a gender lens is to address only an issue for women when it's really a business need that um, has to be addressed. So I think, well, the first tip is one, to identify what that business need is, and then also to ask questions. I think, CJ, you made an excellent point earlier, is it's not to go in there and separate all the gender questions from all the other questions that you need to ask. You need to embed those. And so what we've been doing, and sometimes, what we've been doing with IOs is giving just a couple of questions to ask at the outset, to start to identify what is that potential issue or a potential gender gap that can be addressed and to define it. Because historically, I think a lot, and we're evolving, and it's going to be exciting to see what comes out of the, um, this new uh, gender lens impact and measurement activity, is that it's all, always looking post. And so a lot of activities are pilots, and so there isn't really a baseline yet. And so you're looking at what did we, what could we achieve from nothing, and without having gone previously and defining 
and asking the questions to get to what the real issue is. So I would say that's the first tip. And it's also a great way to just to start to figure out where is your entry point for gender lens investing. Thank you. And CJ? Yeah, I'd reiterate that. I mean, let's, we don't have to approach it as a social mission. Um, there's a really solid business case why we should be doing this. And it, it, there's a lot of research about performance, gender diversity and performance, and we can start there. But there's also a real logical uh, um, approach, which is simply that as you're staffing up your business, if you're ignoring 50% of the talent pool or you're not actively going for 50% of the talent pool, are you really getting the best talent in your company? Um, and what latent talent is everybody else kind of leaving on the table uh, that you can pick up? And from a market perspective, I mean, the women's purchasing power, it, women are the majority of people in the world. If you're going after the women's market, you're going after the biggest market that's out there. And for um, where it stands today, most of your competitors are not really actively going after that market. So it's a huge business opportunity. Um, and as investors, I think it's, it's a pretty easy place to start. Thank you. So we're going to open up the floor for questions. We're going to take uh, three questions at a time. So any questions? We have a hand back there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, my question, I would say in as much as gender lens is investing is a great thing to do, and uh, you just said it's a great business opportunity, um, I'd like to sort of ask a question in, in regards to ownership of assets by women, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and I'll say in Latin America, are any of your organizations looking at creative ways of actually tackling the issue of asset ownership? Because stemming from even as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, some of the toughest thing to do uh, is to walk into a bank and get a loan or even talk to an investor without ha actually having collateral that I own and looking at cultural norms in African society and in other other places. Um, and for me, sometimes I feel that this could be another sort of buzzword that goes around where we're actually not having practical solutions on the ground for entrepreneurs such as myself or even the rural woman who cannot own an asset. Land is a huge issue in African society. A man will never pass on a title that easy to his daughter or his wife. So sometimes I think it becomes a facade that we sit in conferences like this and we, we keep talking about um, genderless investing, whereas on the ground the reality is a, is a totally different issue. So when we're pouring out money to women in sub-Saharan Africa or in, in Latin America, are we actually tackling the core issues on the ground where ownership is key? Because if you don't own anything, at the end of the day, you're literally just still, you know, working in circles. And I mean, whatever you're working on is really never your own, including that investment you're receiving uh, from that uh, impact investor or from the bank. Great. I'll take uh, two more questions. Hi, I'm Courtney Roberts. I lead Moonshot Global Consulting. We have a, we're the MEL partner for a DFAT-funded scaling frontier innovation project that looks at impact investing, social enterprise, and incubators. And our question is, do you see, what areas do you see that are in most of need of investigative studies or research to sort of crystallize gender lens investing for impact investors. And the reason I asked for this is we're looking at, I guess IFC said you have AIM for, for internal purposes. We're looking at gaps in the market for impact investors to have tools that will help them evaluate if they're open to it, uh, gender inv investments from a gender lens. And we're, we're wondering if there's gaps that you know about that could help reveal what these tools may be or how they could be used better or where, they, where they're needed most. One more question up here in the front. Hi, Hi I'm Donna Mertens, and um, I'm from the field of evaluation and research. And uh, a lot of my work has been done with a feminist lens and looking at how do we create that point of leverage for change in cultural norms. Um, 
because if we don't do that, then you'll continue to see the kinds of things that CJ talked about, that with your mouth you say, yes, we endorse gender, but with your actions you don't. And the basis of that are cultural norms mm -hmm. that are exclusive and that are oppressive. And so I guess I'm wondering about your thoughts around that, that it goes beyond the metrics and beyond mm -hmm. the, the statements that say this and where the, where the room is there for addressing these kinds of cultural issues. And I think it picks up on some of the other comments that were made. Mm -hmm. Right. So Heather and CJ. Yeah, so I can take a stab at the, um, so I'll address, uh, I think the first question, thank you, and the last are, are related. So in terms of access to um, ownership of assets, so it's a critical, it's a critical challenge for, for women particularly, and it's such a critical challenge that with, I have, with the World Bank Group, we have a global gender strategy, and one of the core pillars is to increase women's access and ownership of assets, because when you own, let's say it's land, housing, you have access to a bank account, access to a mobile phone, technology, there is a, um, it gives you an opportunity to have, to make decisions and to have agency. And so, and I think part of getting to that increased access to um, ownership of assets and control is also addressing these cultural norms. And so it's inherent in a lot of the advisory work that we're doing. It's very hard to be able to create that change through our investments. But through the ad advice that we have, we do address that. And I'll give you an example of how we did this. And this isn't in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it is in um, in the West Bank and Gaza, so a fragile, it's very, um, it's one of the toughest places to work. And so what we addressed there was, what we found was that women, 65% of women wanted to start a business, but only 15% had the confidence to do so. And why was that confidence so low? Is because they did not have access to networks, to trainings, to a bank account, to opportunities that gave them the ability to make decisions. On, and also, they didn't have the support from their male family members. They didn't have the support from even um, the women in their community. And so this is more through an advisory intervention. But we did go in and we did assess. And it's a lot of trying to understand what these, look, what these cultural norms are. And we can't go in and change a cultural norm overnight. But we can go in and provide some type of influence through, um, in this case, it was a, a training program where we brought together male relationship managers of a commercial bank and paired them with women entrepreneurs and had them work side by side for six months on the businesses. And what came out of that was, um, and we measured this through surveys and interviews, what came out of that was the male perception initially was women can't run businesses. Women don't, and this is a cultural norm, women don't have the ability to run businesses. And that cultural, uh, and that belief had shifted by working side by side with these entrepreneurs. And now these male relationship managers that were part of the program were actually ambassadors for the bank. And we've now seen an uptick, an uptick in bank accounts going to women through um, not only bank accounts, but other financial products like point of sale terminals for women. That's an asset, <laughs> an asset that you can own. And so we've seen an uptick in that because we were able to influence the relationship and the perception that male relationship matters. That's one example, but there needs to be more of that. And we do make, we do strive to do that with our projects because you really need to address or try to integrate the understanding of those social norms to be able to influence change. Mm -hmm. CJ, how would you respond? Um, not adequately. Um, <laughs> every one of these questions are overwhelming uh, that I, you know, for me, and I think everyone in this room. So, um, but I will answer it as the hammer I am, and I will, which is I am an investor in um, finance companies. So, looking at each of your questions as a nail to me. The first one about asset ownership, that for an investor in financial services, you start to have to look at the product and the product design. And when we were talking about diligence and all the aspects of a company where gender comes in, 
Um, so the thing I think about is, yes, not having access to, to land title, not having access to collateral is a huge problem for women. Um, that was partially solved by group lending, right? So, okay, we'll do social collateral instead. But that then falls away when you're doing SME lending and you're back facing the same problem. So in the product design, you have to do things like, okay, I'm not going to lend... Um, this equipment, or I won't lend this house unless the woman's name is on the title and there's some ownership. But there's only so much you can do about that. So we also have to figure out how to uh, change laws. You know, I mean, some of this stuff is regulatory, change customs. But we we have to recognize it's a problem, and if everyone approaches it a little bit, at least you know, hit the nail uh, p part of the problem that you can hit. Um, I think that's what we have to do and are responsible to do. Um, Regarding the question about research and what research gaps are missing, one of the things that we're finding as an investor, and I don't, you know, we're making, we have 10 investments, so this is not statistically significant and we can't draw conclusions. But while we all know that um, women are better repayers, and this is consistent when you're talking about group lending, the story changes with SME, um, where they're, not always better, not always worse, sometimes about the same. But there is a, di there is a difference. And I think women are, um, f from what I'm seeing, women need more. Women invariably get lower loan sizes, invariably across the portfolio in SME. So what, what's going on? I mean, are their businesses underinvested? Um, and, and so, or do they not, do they need more business support? Do they not have access to networks? I would like to see more research on SME in particular and how we can make sure that the outcomes for women are as, as good. Um, and then the cultural norms problem, again, I think it's gonna be baby steps. I think we need to know when we're talking about a cultural norm that can't be changed or a cultural norm. So one of the things that I'm um, thinking about is a big problem we have, for example, in India is a huge disparity between women as loan officers. I mean, they just don't work as loan officers. If they're not working as loan officers, they're not going to grow into branch managers. They're not going to get those leadership positions. Um, but there's a lot of problems. Families don't want their daughters working. They certainly don't, there's a safety issue too. They certainly don't want their daughters going into villages on their own at dusk and carrying money around, right? But there was another problem we found is simply that a lot of times in India, the loan officers are living in the branches. So, okay, you're not gonna have a woman living in a house with a bunch of men, but it, one of our companies found that they could set up dorms for women, and suddenly, you know, if you bring more than one woman in and you give her proper housing, or just put a bathroom, a woman's bathroom in the branch, I mean, these little things um, can start to have a difference. So now you're gonna have some pioneering women going, okay, I can do this job, and, and that then creates um, role models, and so sometimes you have to unpack the culture to see you know, what's behind it. Is it just a matter of the women don't have a safe place to go to the bathroom? Well, that I can fix. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll stop talking at that point, but so these are big issues, yeah, but I think they can issues. be worked on, and if we all, you know, pitch in, we can start to overcome them. Um, I didn't actually address the question on the, the measurement. I do want to add just one tidbit from what we're seeing in terms of where, at least in terms of the gaps in the research. I mean, I think one of the big things that's being asked right now is how do you measure success? of gender lens investing. And so one of the key ways that we've been trying to do this is to really understand what, how a company measures success, like what are the KPIs for that company. I'll give an example with childcare. So childcare, I mean, the care demands for women is one of the biggest um, challenges in getting women into the workforce and getting women to participate in entrepreneurial activities, not just childcare, but also elderly care. Um, 
And so it's a really big challenge. And so one of the ways, and there's a gap in data, in ter there was a gap in data in terms of how can companies benefit by providing these types of services to their women employees. And so, I mean, case studies oftentimes are not looked at as a rigorous way for measurement, but they're so, doing those case studies provides so much insights around the why, the context, what, was, what approach was used, um, what worked. And so we did put a report together on tackling childcare, and that's one example, but I do think there needs to be more in terms of all the different lenses that are being approached through gender lens investing to kind of pull out what are the metrics of success, and also for what approach and why. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those additional thoughts. Mm -hmm. I wish we had time for more questions, but we have mm -hmm. to wrap up our panel. So I'm going to ask the, the panelists to share any final thoughts. What's next for IFC What's in the coming months? Yeah, great. So. Um, What's next for IFC? So we're, <laughs> gender lens investing is core to our work. In terms of the um, private equity and venture capital space, so we are working with Women's World Banking and very excited about this and putting together a training program for fund managers all across the investment cycle on what to look at um, for gender and also we'll be piloting that at the end of the year. So that's the one big thing that we're super excited about um, that's coming up. Fantastic, mm -hmm. and CJ, what's, what's next? Well, we're also excited about <laughs> that. Okay. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> and what we are doing and, and also working with, with IFC is um, we just, we wanna make the research, research and um, assessments core, which is something we haven't been able to do in the past because it takes technical assistance resources. But going forward, we're hoping to um, raise capital so that when we make an investment, we can um, start right away and look at a way at the, very rigorously how a company is recruiting, retaining, promoting women, and then also reaching women in their markets um, effectively, efficiently, um, with a wide variety of products. So we're trying to um, take that investment approach one step further and actually give them real tools to achieve the dream of uh, gender diverse organizations and gender diverse client bases. Great, thank you Heather and CJ. This is a really dynamic panel. I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight the GIN has a gender lens initiative as well as the navigating impact tool, a, a, a gender lens theme that you can explore. We can talk about that more at 2.45 and the uh, gender lens breakout session. So let's thank our panel and we really appreciate you. <laughs>
um, get to know everyone. Um, depending on how big your session is, you may not have time to go around and do like an in-depth introduction of everyone, but at least um, say names, maybe a fun fact about yourself, um, sort of create a safe space for a really fruitful discussion. And I think the key thing here is we're going to be back in this room at noon. And so every group is going to need to do sort of a quick report out of um, the things that they think the whole conference, the whole, um, all everyone that's here today should know about their session and any lingering questions that they might like to pose to the group. So I would recommend sort of allocating the last 15 minutes or so to um, really getting consensus around what you want to report back to your group and maybe assigning someone to be, to sort of have that role so that they can keep it in mind. Um, so yeah, with that, um, we're gonna have a quick break. So let's say, please try to get to your unconference room by 11 p.m. Um, and then be back in here for noon, by noon for report out. And then we will, go, sorry, go into lunch and then go into uh, demo sessions at 1.30. So I'm gonna put up the schedule and um, you will notice that that last room mayor is available for anyone who's disappointed that their session is not on the agenda. In true unconference style, you are welcome to sort of rebel and um, talk about anything you want to talk about. If it's you and two people, like you're welcome to sit out here in this area. Again, um, really try and make the most of this time and be thinking about your report back at noon. So with that, I will let you guys go.